I am honored uh, and saddened to introduce Dr. Jack Beerworth to you today. Dr. Beerworth has been superintendent of schools for Portland since July of 1992. And as you know, unfortunately, he will leave Portland at the end of this school year to return to New York as the head of Outward Bound USA. Dr. Beerworth started his educational journey as a sixth grade math teacher and counselor in New York City. He then worked several years with the National Alternative Schools Program and spent seven more years in administrative positions in New York public schools. Before coming to Oregon, he held two separate district superintendent positions in New York State. Jack Beerworth graduated from Yale University and he obtained a doctorate in educational administration from the University of Massachusetts. In college, he played rugby and hockey with relish, and he has remained an enthusiastic baseball fan. During the most intense of school budget crises, he served as the coach of his daughter's soccer team, and he could be found watching other games surrounded by papers and briefcases. A true workaholic, Jack's associates, fear his announcement that he will be in early the next morning, as they fear this may mean 4 a.m. instead of the usual 6.30 or 7 a.m. arrival time. Dr. Beerworth collects books. He loves ideas, which he likes to discuss whenever he can be pried away from his cell phone uh, or his computer, or he isn't actively defending the school's budget for Portland School District. His offers to move to other school districts have been numerous, but he has steadfastly resisted them, indicating that he wanted his own three children to remain in Portland's fine public schools. Jack Beerworth's wife, Jane, has been quoted as saying that we are fortunate that he will speak to us today rather than sing. <laughs> we. We, the City Club members, do indeed send your, sing your praises, Jack Beerworth, and we are so pleased that you will speak with us today and share your ideas about K-12 through public education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jack Beerworth. Oh my. I sing horribly. Um, I played hockey and rugs, rugby with relish, yes, not well, but with relish. And um, I have likened it to the way I was a superintendent um, with relish and gusto, and not necessarily well, but with enthusiasm. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address the City Club. When I was invited today, I, was, I, was, I asked Nancy Hadeen if she had any particular suggestions. She said, well, Jack, you don't have to be witty, witty or intellectual, just be yourself. <laughs> so following her advice, I'd like to... Sh I'd like to share with you some words of wisdom from a few famous people which apply to the challenges facing the Portland Public Schools today. On the subject of our continuing struggle to get adequate funding, I'm reminded of the exchange in the Peanuts comic strip where Linus says, well, you lose a few and you win a few. And Charlie Brown responds, oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? With respect to our future prospects, I would quote former Vice President Dan Quayle, who once said, the question is whether we're going to go forward to tomorrow or we're going to go past to the back. <laughs> and I can only hope we avoid the kind of disastrous action proposed by one leader who said, yesterday we stood on the precipice of a great abyss, and today we've taken a giant step forward. <laughs> We are facing some huge challenges. 
The fact is our school district is at a critical crossroads. Yogi Berra, Yogi Berra said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> but it isn't that easy. We have to choose which path, and there is no in-between. We either get behind educational reform with the full force of our full commitment, or watch it go down the tubes. The moment of truth is here. Today, I'd like to tell you where we stand, where we want to go, and what we'll have to do to get there. In assessing our current situation, I'd like to borrow the line from Charles Dickens in A Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Believe it or not, this is in some ways the best of times. Test scores are up, students are achieving at higher levels, and the structure for education reform is in place. To list some of our accomplishments, since 1981, student achievement in reading and math has increased by more than a grade level. That means that fourth graders today are achieving better than fifth graders were more than a decade ago. Over half of the Portland public school students take the SATs compared to just over 40% national, nationally. Despite this, Portland scores are roughly 30%, 30 points higher than the national numbers. And in math, Portland's SAT scores are higher than the state average. At Lincoln High School, the average SAT and math, math and verbal scores are higher than any other public high school in the area. Whoops, I lost a page. Hold on a second. Or better than any in the region. Better than Beaverton, better than Lake Oswego, better than West Lynn. In fact, they're also better than Jesuit. And out of the top 25 schools in Oregon with the highest fifth grade uh, scores in math, 14 are in the Portland schools. That is 14 out of the top 25 out of 750 statewide. On the eighth grade level, in math, nine out of the top 15 are in Portland. In addition to all of this, we have put into place the basic outlines for major educational reform. That reform is aimed at the vision statement adopted last fall by our school board. Our vision statement says, all students achieve, no exceptions, no excuses. Let me repeat that. All students achieve, no excuses, no ex exceptions, no excuses. It is a bold vision, even a daring one. It says that we don't just want the smart kids or the rich kids to achieve at high levels. We want each and every student to achieve high standards every minority child, every poor child, every slow learning child, no exceptions, no excuses. As far as I know, the Portland School District is the only city district in the United States which, with such an ambitious dream and the chance of attaining it. We have adopted standards that are amazingly high. The Oregon Education Act for the 21st century established K through 12 standards and called for classroom practices that would, quote, achieve the best educated citizens in the nation and the world. Portland Public Schools has adopted those tough standards and more. We have also voluntarily committed to the college entry proficiencies required by the Oregon State System of Higher Education. That means that all, each and every single student in the Portland School District, from pre-kindergarten through 12th grade, will be working towards college level entrance standards. The Pew Charitable Trust has selected us as one of only seven districts in the nation to receive a grant for putting standards-based system into place. Right now, every one of our schools is being required to develop a school improvement plan to implement the higher standards. As part of that initiative, each school must describe how it will develop individual improvement plans to help students who are not yet performing at the standards level get to those standards. It is not simply a question of setting the standards and then saying five years down the road, well, some students made it and some didn't. We are required and we are expecting ourselves to develop plans which will get each and every student to those standards. 
our efforts to achieve reform are gaining momentum. But without the funding and the community support they need, they will not succeed, which brings us to the worst of times. I am not going to rehash all the details of our funding problems over the past six years. Suffice it to say that for four years, we kept the budget cuts away from the classroom. In the last two years, we could no longer do that. Teacher positions were cut and class sizes were increased. Today, the average class size in our elementary schools is 28 to 29 kids compared to 25 six years ago, compared even to 25 three years ago. Over the past five years, we've lost 900 district staff positions, eliminated programs such as the entire curriculum department, cut back on the purchase of textbooks and other basic supplies. At this point, we could well face another $15 million budget shortfall next year, which would require substantial additional cuts. Should Measure 52 not be approved, our finances and those of other districts across the state would be in much dire straits. The net effect is that we are faced with implementing sweeping reforms during a period of unprecedented financial reductions. We are further hurt by the fact that Oregon has become a fairly inhospitable place to being a, to being a teacher. Teachers have to contend not only with funding shortfalls and uncertainties, but also ballot measures out of the blue, like ballot measure eight, that could change their circumstances overnight. Our teachers are putting in long hours and at the same time getting kicked in the teeth. They are also paying more money out of their own pockets to buy supplies. Some of them are laying out hundreds of dollars a year to buy the materials their students need. The environment for our teachers is made worse by the archaic and adversarial relationship between the school district and the teachers union. Our lab labor management relations are reminiscent of the automo automobile industry in the early 1980s. We are stuck in a model that even industry doesn't use anymore, the they versus we mentality. The solving of problems through grievances, the practice of forcing every issue through the administration of the bargaining agreement. The real tragedy is that we're spending our time haggling over contract issues instead of tackling the major problems that need to be solved. For example, Senate Bill 880, approved last session, provides guidelines on how to remove poorly performing teachers. What it doesn't do is to provide a system for motivating and supporting people. How do we reward the good teachers? How do we create an atmosphere in which they can enjoy professional freedom public support and community appreciation. If we wish to throw open the whole relationship between the teachers and school districts, Senate Bill 880 could be used as an opportunity to completely reshape the relationship between districts and teachers. So far, we haven't touched it. Both the union and the district share the blame for this negative relationship, and both will have to change to improve it. We need to do it sooner than later, because getting all the kids to a achieve at high levels will require teamwork to an unprecedented degree. The high standards are like a wall our students will have to scale. Some kids are going to need extra help getting over that wall. Without that help, they'll crash into it. Our job is not to just set the standards and wait for kids to crash into them. It's to work together to set the standards and make sure that the crashes don't happen. I want to repeat that. Our job is not to just set the standards and wait for kids to crash into them. It is to work together to set the standards and make sure that the crashes don't happen. Some people say we've set ourselves up for failure with such ambitious goals. I admit to being someone who has refused to back down from the vision of all kids achieving. To me, that's what public schools are all about. Every kid gets a chance, every kid can succeed. I believe that in that dream, because of the inspiring results I've seen at some of our schools, Woodlawn and Kenton, two of our elementary schools with a high percentage of minority and low-income children, have ranked among the top schools in the state for their fifth grade math scores. They've made an amazing turnabout through a lot of hard work and tireless commitment to raising achievement levels. It may be harder to help low-income children achieve the standards, but it's not impossible. 
If Woodlawn can do it, why not Humboldt? It's been two generations since Brown versus the Board of Education, and still we are so far from equity. When, the two when are the two lines going to intersect for the performance of minority and white students? When are we going to stop settling for anything less? These issues belong to the entire community and they demand attention. The question is, are we going to embrace our responsibility to help each and every child succeed or duck it? Unfortunately, our local communities currently have little sense of ownership in their neighborhood schools. Education in Oregon has become more of a political football than a community responsibility. The state legislature controls local school funding more than the community does. In New York, we had to take our budget out for a community vote every year, not just the levy, the actual budget. It was not a fun process, and many of my superintendent colleagues hated it. I thought it made a great deal of sense because it gave the local citizens a sense of empowerment and created a strong partnership for improving education. The discussion in Oregon has become so politicized that we can hardly talk about the real issues anymore, like, what do we want for our kids? What are we willing to do to get it? Instead, we have, we have people making decisions based on polls, sounding tough and doing nothing. Seven-second sound bites may sell a political candidate, but they don't address our problems. So we end up with anomalies like an education reform bill that has no funding attached to it. Only now, six years after House Bill 3565 was enacted, do we have a cross-functional team in place that will tie our goals to strategies and strategies to cost. It is absolutely appalling that it took six years to initiate that ac action. I consider that negligence on an embarrassingly gross level. Despite the passages of measures 5, 47, and 50, the public is actually more frustrated with government than ever. The latest polls are discouraging, in fact, depressing. According to a survey this August by a respected research firm, voters still believe that there is, quote, rampant waste, fraud, and abuse in government spending, including schools. They think we have plenty of money, that we just aren't spending it right. Their top priority for education is not more parental involvement or smaller classes or more computers. It is reducing the cost of school administration. I am at a loss to how to get this message across. There is simply no fat to cut. We are down to the bone. Somehow we have to get the truth across to people, the truth about school finance, our commitments to kids, and the number of children who will fail to reach the standards at the current level of funding. We have to stop skewing the issues and ducking the realities. Everybody knows about the Oregon Health Plan, what it covers and what it doesn't. We need simply something similar for our schools. This is what's covered, this is what isn't, and this is what we expect the consequences to be. Somebody with enough guts to stand up and say that at current levels of funding, 25% of our kids aren't gonna make it. The polls show that what people want most is accountability from their schools. They are willing to provide funding if they're sure it will lead to results. Until now, we have not done a very good job of linking funding to academic achievement. But it isn't too late. Despite the problems, what we have in place right now, the way we have set up our schools reform is the best thing going in the United States. And if you can do it in a city this diverse, you can do it anywhere. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that it is within our grasp. Which leads me to my own perspective and involvement. The people of this community have been very supportive of me personally in both my tenure as a superintendent in my, and in my decision to take another job this January. They have assumed that I am leaving out of frustration. I'd be nuts not to be frustrated. But that is not the reason I am leaving. I was offered an absolutely terrific job, and for many personal and professional reasons, it's the right choice for me. But I want you to know, even with all the struggles, and yes, the frustrations, there is no place I'd rather be superintendent than in Portland, Oregon. 
I've waited for 25 years to be part of what we are doing here and what we are trying to achieve for our kids. And we're the only ones bold enough to try. You can't do it in Philadelphia or Detroit. And for me, there is, no, there is not the same professional satisfaction in going to a suburban school district. No one is as far along as we are. But the day of reckoning has arrived. We can either drive toward the goals we've set collectively and as a community, or we can let them slip away. It would be all too easy to start compromising out of political safeguarding or intellectual laziness. But Portland, this is a dream within your grasp, within your reach. Those of you who saw the movie Apollo 13 will remember the dramatic scene when the astronauts were losing oxygen and their spacecraft systems were failing. There was outright panic and fear for their lives. In the midst of all of it, Mission Control turned to his staff, who were telling him all the things which could not be done, and said, quote, failure is not an option. As you pursue these issues, please remember that as a community, the future of thousands of children's children is in your hands. They need adults who are courageous enough to step forward and do what is needed to give each and every one of them a fighting chance. It is a huge responsibility, so huge that failure is not an option. In closing, let me say that it has been an honor to serve this city and its school district. We've been through a lot together, we have learned a lot, and we've accomplished some great things. I will hope I, will, I hope you will keep going in my absent, absence and hold fast to this dream. Wherever I go, I'm pulling for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, in the years that you've been here, you've had to deal with the effects of uh, property tax limitations, but we've seen limitations like these passed in other states over the past 10 to 15 years. I'm wondering whether Portland's funding crisis for public education is unique or whether other states are similarly having to deal with the effects of property tax and other tax limitations in similar ways. Thank you. Um, lots of school districts around the United States are struggling. But I think that what's happened in Oregon, to the best of my ability to research it, is in fact unique. First of all, on a per-student basis, Oregon today is, is for the first time since 1992-93 above where we were in 1992-93, unadjusted for inflation. We are today, as a state, spending just barely the same amount that we were in 1992, 93, six years. And even with the low inflation that we're talking about, that is a substantial drop in purchasing power. And I'm not talking just about Portland, I'm talking about the state as a whole. The assumption has been that this has been a crisis only for a handful of districts. Uh, Portland, Tigard, some of the more affluent districts. We're in still better shape than many of, many of the smaller districts. Um, the Elgin School District that I, I used many, many times as an example, uh, before Measure 5 had a staff of 39. By two years ago, they were down to 27. And I'm not sure where they are this fall. I cannot imagine running a kindergarten through a 12th grade school district with, with 25 or 27 teachers. The Oregon City School District uh, has lost 25, 30% of their staff members. When Measure 5 was passed, the state also tried to equalize, which meant a double whammy for school districts like Portland and Tigard and Lake Oswego. We have been brought down to an average which has gone nowhere. As best I can tell, other districts which talk about struggles, what they mean is that instead of a five or six percent increase, which is what they were anticipating, they got a two or three. When I arrived in Portland, we had a budget of $355 million. This year, we have a budget of 335 with 2,000 more students. Um, we are substantially below where we were. I know of no one else in the United States who's gone through that kind of struggle. 
which makes it particularly embarrassing when you contrast it against the promises of House Bill 3565, which, were passed, which was passed after Measure 5. I go to national conferences and people say, what's it like to have a longer school year? Um, how's it going? Because they assume that since we promised it, we did it. Um, I have to turn to them and tell them we haven't done it yet. Yes. Dr. Beerworth, Dan Finley, City Club member. Many of the contentions that are made by the critics of public education are made either on the basis of misinformation or on misinterpretation. Statistics can lie, people can lie effectively with statistics. Is there a way in your mind, and could you share that with us please, that we can bring the citizenry together in a proactive manner to work towards solutions? We hear lots of people talking about what's wrong. We need more people jumping in to help make it right. I'm going to leap sort of straight to the solution from your question. Um, and if you want, I'll backtrack. But my advice would be for us to do two things. The first thing is, frankly, to start telling people the truth. Um, we keep telling people that there's a crisis here or there, and then they pick up the paper and find out that this level of government or that level of government, um, the state, we said we had a whole of such and such, and then all of a sudden $400 million appeared. Um, I was out campaigning for the sales tax, one of many issues that I campaigned for while I was here. I said to people, because I was shown the figures that the state had a two and a half billion dollar hole that we needed the sales tax to fill. The sales tax failed. By just after election day, the two and a half billion dollar hole had gone from two and a half to a billion and a half to 700 million. I frankly felt like a fool. Now, the fact was we had a problem. It was not a $2.5 billion problem. It was a $700 million problem. And a $700 million problem is a serious problem. And that doesn't even address the things that we um, promised in things like House Bill 3565. But we've got to start telling people the truth. I am incredibly proud of the results that the Portland School District achieves. But the fact is that we do better for some students than we do for others. And I am pleased that the Portland School District has begun to disaggregate the data and show that we have students who are not doing well. Yeah, we ought to be proud, but we also ought to say we're leaving some students behind. And we want to talk about the students we're leaving behind. And it's dangerous to start talking about the truth because somebody comes and puts it as a headline. You know, you, you, Instead of talking about the 98 students that you did well with, they talk about the two who didn't make it. The second, and I talked briefly about this in my remarks, education does not belong in the political arena. We are getting further and further and further away from communities controlling their own schools. And that should not mean the kind of situation which existed in Oregon before ballot measure five when there were school districts that spent one third of what the richest districts did. Local control should not mean inequity. But, it, but, but schools should not be controlled and run the same way that roads and other statewide services are. They belong to the communities. And the further we get away from that, the more trouble we're going to have. And if we stay this way, I think five or 10 years down the road, it will be considerably worse than we're, in, we're now. I like the system where you take something to your local community in the budget and you say, you know, do you, are you willing to pay for class sizes of 25? Are you willing to pay for class sizes of 23? And here's what it takes. And go directly with, to people. That's what private industry does. You go out and you sell your services or your product. But when somebody buys your service or your product, you have a bond with them that at this moment is disappearing in education. I think we had more of it before Measure 5. We are losing it rapidly now. 
That goes back to, the, to your question. We're not going to get a solution going the way we're going. We're not going to get a solution if we don't tell people the truth and if we keep divorcing public schools from their communities. We will pay an awful price. Thank you. Sid Lezak, member. When I brag about Portland, I use a conversation you had with a small group of us when you first came here, and we asked, why did you come to Portland? And you said at that time, I came here because Portland was the last big city in the United States in which middle class uh, families were not moving out because of the school uh, situation. What I want to know is uh, now, uh, some years later, uh, do you feel my bragging rights are in danger? No, your bragging rights aren't in danger because we are the only one left around um, and nobody else is moving back into that status. But, and I hope I'm not offending anybody who's from Detroit because I picked Detroit to pick on, but just being better than Detroit doesn't really do a whole lot for me as a parent or as an educator. My kids are going to these schools, not Detroit's. I want to have the best schools that, we've, that are available. We are indeed, uh, as I said we were when I came, the only reasonably whole American city left. At the point at which I arrived, 92% of the students of, who were of school age who lived in the city went to the public schools. We're not sure exactly what the percentage is now, but it is less than 90, and it is declining. Other cities like Seattle, the best information I have is that roughly 70 percent of, of, the, of the students who are school age who live in that city go to the public schools. But even if 90 percent of the students who are school age in Seattle went to the public schools, it still wouldn't be comparable to our situation. Because what has happened in other major cities is that families with school-aged children, once they're ready to go to school, if they can, they move to the suburbs, or if they stay, they send their kids to private schools. Portland has not been a city like that. We may be coming that. Um, we counted our enrollment. Uh, you may have seen the articles in the Oregonian uh, at the beginning of October. Our kindergarten enrollment is down almost 400 students this fall. Now, maybe they'll come back in the first grade. Maybe they won't. It's also down in West Lynn and Tigard and parts of Beaverton and a few other s suburban areas. And some that were down had expected to be up by quite a lot. I don't think that's a good sign at all, not only for us, but for those other suburbs as well. It is certainly a note of serious caution. It says to me that if people have other options, which often they do at kindergarten level, they're starting to take them. They're starting to hedge their bets. And people who start to hedge their bets start placing their bets. Um, there is not a great deal of confidence. Uh, As someone who has come to love this city and state passionately, and I am a convert, and like most converts, I'm maybe a little more zealous than someone who is um, not a convert, I am deeply worried by what I see as the complacency in Portland and in Oregon, which assumes that because we do things that are good and special, that they will necessarily remain good and special forever. We have good schools not because somebody up there dropped it on us. We have good schools because this community said we wanted good schools and made it that way. The other things that make for a good quality of life, that make for a good working environment in Oregon were made by people. They are not innately Oregonian. They are not innate to Portland. We could lose them just the way every other city has lost them. And we will lose them, unless we are lucky, if we don't tend to them. And I am very, very, very worried that people assume that just because it's there and it has been, that it will necessarily remain that way. That is a very dangerous assumption. 
Um, for some time, I did not believe what um, Myron Ort Or Orloff, Ortloff um, was, selling, was saying. I had seen his presentations. Um, I will come back and see his presentation in two or three weeks. What he has to say is truly frightening. He is talking about this city changing in ways which most of us, including myself, do not perceive on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that will take people saying, we need to stop this and change it. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Wheeler, uh, perhaps this question has to do with uh, morality and versus pragmatism. And I, I'm afraid sometimes, in this particular instance, ballot measure 52, I might be pragmatic, because I think I'll vote for it. <clears throat> but do you see any kind of, do you feel any kind of conflict uh, when we think about financing our kids' schools with gambling money? Yeah, except I'd say I have an even worse conflict. When the legislative session ended, we told people, we, that is people in schools and the legislature, said to people, this is the funding package for the next two states, and this is the amount of money that will come to Portland, will come to Beaverton, will come to Tigard, will come to Elgin. What we didn't tell people was that there was an asterisk next to the second year. And the asterisk was that they had to vote for this measure um, on election day. And the money that is to be voted on in election day was part of the package that was approved at the end of the legislative session. So by implication, we are saying that there is more money around than there really is. There is, in effect, a certain amount of double counting. I think that that will come back to haunt us, come back to haunt us a great deal. Because if approved, that's $150 million, Portland share roughly 15, which will not be there at the beginning of the next legislative session. The funding base will be $150 million lower than where we are right now. Now, I am an incredibly passionate advocate of of ballot measure 52. Without it, we are in extraordinary difficulty. Portland, instead of facing something like a $15 million hole, just to stay even with where we are, will be facing a $30 million hole. And other districts will be deeper in, into difficulty. I said in my remarks that education had become a political football. We have to stop using education as a way to pry more money out of people, whether it is through the lottery or something else. We know that education is the easiest way to sell ballot measures. So what gets dumped out in front of the voters? And I know because I've campaigned for every single one of them. What gets dumped out in front of the voters? Education. The state passed ballot measure 11, required huge amounts of funding for corrections and um, in institutions. There was, no, there was no requirement that anybody vote any funding measure for that. Contrast that with House Bill 3565, in which we promised something, but it didn't drive any money. We've got to stop doing this to kids. Force the state, force all of ourselves to think this through and say, what is it that we really want for, for our community? Roads, hospitals, and school districts. And then decide how we're going to fund it and stop doing gimmicky things like funding bond issues out of lottery measures and throwing this all out in front of the voters. I am very worried about what we're doing. Um, I think we're facing a very, very tough funding situation next um, legislative session. But you can make it a whole lot worse by voting no on the ballot measure. So swallow your moral scruples. I don't care where the money comes from. 
My, my knees have lots of calluses on them. Actually, my chin and my, my elbows as well. Um, I will grovel for a vote. Uh, Kurt Wabring, City Club member. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about not money, but education. Good. <laughs> um, the uh, Oregon's uh, School Reform Act, it has certain conceptions about doing things differently, outcomes, certificate of initial mastery, certificate of advanced mastery. I wonder if you could comment about what you think the suitability at this point is of that concept and any ideas you have for changing or improving it. I think it's the best thing going in the country. And let me tell you why. For most of the United States, there is no comparability from one classroom to the next, one high school to the next, or one school to the next, one school district to the next. Our standards are for each, are for everybody, and they are the same from one classroom to the next. So we are holding ourselves accountable across the board. The second revolution is that they are based on proficiencies, what a student knows and can do instead of seat time. And that's incredibly significant, probably much more significant than most people realize. I studied French for seven years before I got to college. I could not have ordered water in a restaurant after seven years. What we are saying as a state is that what counts, using my analogy, is whether you can speak, read, write, hear French, understand French. Not how many years you took it, not where you learned it, not how you learned it, but whether you have the skills and knowledge. And we as adults know that it doesn't really make any difference once you get out into life, whether, you're, whether it's in your job or as a citizen, what degree you got or how many times you studied it, but whether you know it and can do it. And so we're turning the educational system on its head. And lastly, we are, as far as I know, the only state that is serious about getting each and every student to those standards. And that is probably the greatest revolution going on in the United States. I wish we had not overlain all of that significant stuff with a gobbledygook about certificates of initial mastery and certificates of advanced mastery. We lost the public on that. If we had simply gone out to the public and said that what we were doing as a state was setting standards based on proficiencies and that we were going to expect them of each and every child, I think we'd have a lot more understanding and support now. Instead, what we did was we went out and started talking about portfolios and certificates of initial mastery and certificates of advanced mastery. Having said that it is the best thing going, I will also tell you that I am very, very worried. I pushed for the standards to be as high as possible and for them to go into place on the dates that we had set in the belief that if we did that to ourselves, we would force ourselves as a state, not as the governor or the state legislature, but us collectively as adults to deal with the consequences before it got to the day when the crash was due to happen. We are now only a year and a half away from the date that the first certificate's initial mastery will be awarded. And I worry about the consequences of the crash. It does not need to happen, but emergency actions are going to need to happen right now. And someone is going to have to step in in the same way that Mission Control did in the movie and in real life and say that failure is not an option. Now, there's one way to remove that failure. There are two way, three ways to remove that failure. One is to lower the standards, and I hope we don't do that. The second is to move the date out, and I hope we don't do that. And the third is to do something about it right now. But if we don't, a year and a half from now, something like 
half or more of the students in the state in the 10th grade at that point will not make the standards. We know that. We know that not because schools are failing, but because we have set the standards at such an incredibly high level. And let me give you, I, I'm sorry for prolonging this, but let me give you some frame of reference. We have done, other districts have done, rough correlations of what's necessary in order to be able to get, to reach the standard in math by the end of the 10th grade. To, to, to achieve at that level, a student will probably have to have taken algebra, geometry, and trigonometry. Half of the kids in Oregon, half of the kids in the United States never get beyond two years of general math. And so if we don't do something fairly drastically right now to get the bottom half of our class taking and passing algebra and geometry and trigonometry, their chances of getting a 239, which is what's going to be required in math, are almost zero. Now, we can do it by starting to have double periods of algebra, starting to have algebra with some after-school help or teaching algebra over a two-year period of time. We can do it. But that requires money, and it requires community support, and it requires the willingness to do it. I won't be here when that happens. But if it does happen, the calls for failure and throwing out the system will be huge. There will be people who say this is, the, this is a perfect example of why public schools are a failure, disband public education. And we will play into their hands if we don't do something about it between now and then. David Wu, City Club member. Jack, having a, your dream job in your pocket can be a very, very liberating experience. People are, tell me I'm smiling a lot. <laughs> I didn't think I wasn't smiling before, but people are telling me that I'm smiling a lot. Well, are there things that you wanted to say to the governor, the legislature, <laughs> <laughs> or the taxpayers of Oregon, which you held back on over the last five years? And if so, would you care to share those thoughts with us today? <laughs> You could ask Jane or Sandy, and you might get a truthful answer. Um, I had an interview with the Willamette Week, and what I think they wanted was a whole lot of pithy quotes zinging one person after another. I have my frustrations with people, and I have tried to let some of them out today. But that would be too easy. If the people in this state wanted it corrected and told the legislature and the governor to correct it, it would get corrected. The failure is not theirs. The failure is ours. Now, I am appalled by the lack of leadership in the state. I am appalled by the fact that we are, as I said, talking tough and doing nothing about it, that we have second se seven-second sound bites. And I would refer you to the Oregonian editorial today talking about tax reform. I've heard tax reform talked about since the spring of 1992 when I was being interviewed. But I will also tell you what people told me during the spring of 1992, and they weren't just people working for the school district or legislators or the mayor or somebody else. What they said was, and I, I would literally word for word the same from hundreds of people was, Oregonians care too much about good public services in general and good schools in particular to let anything serious happen. And we let it happen. We all let it happen. We obviously didn't care enough. How else could we have gone through four years of Barbara Roberts and two years of John Kitzhaber before a cross-functional team to implement 3565 was set up? That's disgraceful. And it's not their fault alone, because if the, if the parents 
and grandparents and next door neighbors had said, we believe in the educational reform. You've said you want to do it. We supported its passage. But you have zero in the way of a plan to implement it. I think they would have done something about it. And I think that if we had said every time somebody stood up and said, we need to have tax reform in this state, and had responded to that statement with, yes, and tell us tomorrow what you're going to do about it, instead of going out and voting for somebody, we wouldn't be where we are. But all of us have a greater level of collective responsibility for this than I think we're willing to take account for. And so while I'd like to say some things about people, it would, it would focus the attention in the wrong places. And if, and if you will allow me, I'm going to rub it in. I have said from the time that I've been here and from the time that I've been a superintendent, it's one of the ways that I remind myself of what my job is all about. A year is a long time for a child. If they get to fifth grade and what should be there isn't there, they don't get to go back and take it over again. And if a student gets to high school and has been working in math in order to get to a calculus course and the calculus course wasn't there because there wasn't enough money, they don't get to go back and take calculus again or take it outside of direct instruction. What about the kids who wait all their lives to be part of some high school drama production or to be on an athletic team? The last drama production that I was in was in the middle of high school. And most people who are in drama productions in high school never do that again in their lives. Maybe they do that when they're much later, much older. It's, however, one of the great experiences. And many athletes, the last time they're, they're on an athletic team is in high school. And if those athletic teams aren't there when kids are ready to, to, ready to participate, they don't get to be, come back and take them again. And so while we as adults can say, well, these things take a long time and you have to work it through the process and all of that, baloney. Our kids have been through six years of this, and they are paying a huge price. And we owe them better than that. And I will be honest and unfortunately a bit pessimistic. I think that we are looking at at least two to four more years of this, at least, which would mean that a child who would have been at the very beginning of their educational career at the time Measure 5 was passed would be entering high school. And we as adults would have been dithering while they went through our school systems. That is not reasonable. It, in fact, is unconscionable as far as I am concerned. If we don't get to do something as adults in one year, we say to ourselves, well, we can do it next year. That isn't an option for kids. And they are paying a price, and they are, and they are, and they are paying it um, more dearly than they realize. They know that for kids who want to go on to college, they know that they need to work hard and be competitive. But we have a better idea than they do of just how fine that margin is between the ability to get into a competitive college and not. And we know what kind of education it takes in order to give a chance to a kid to earn that margin. And so many of them are paying a bigger price than they even realize. They're working hard. They're thinking they're doing everything that they could, and they are. But we're not backing them up. And when they don't get into the competitive colleges or they don't get the jobs that they could have gotten if they'd had the services, they won't ever know it. But we should. And we should be worried about it for them, for our community, for our state.
Dr. Beerworth, uh, thank you so much. Um, I want you to know that you looked absolutely great today in the red tie that your wife suggested that you wear. But more importantly, you sounded great. And we all are aware of the red flag that you've raised over these issues. Uh, and I promise you that uh, the City Club and those of us who are members of the City Club and citizen activists have heard what you've said and will indeed make an effort to uh, bring about the changes that you have punctuated for us. Thank you so much. And please, all of you, do remember to vote. And if you don't belong to the City Club, join. We stand adjourned. Thank you.